uh, just, just looking ahead here, coming programs, um, we're scheduled all the way through to next July, <laughs> about a year ahead. Uh, September 27th, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives will show some vintage photos of our, our town and our county. October 25th, uh, Hillary Fleck of the Monroe County History Center will show highlights from the uh, Herald Times archive photo collection. They've scanned a bunch of photos. Uh, uh, the Herald Times gave them their whole collection of uh, negatives for them to scan. November 29th, March Faber will give a history of the local post offices. January 3rd, 2023, Dr. Roger Robinson will give an interesting program, I think, uh, entitled The Eighth Wonder of the World, the Indianapolis Traction Terminal, which I don't know much about, so that uh, should be interesting. Uh, January 31st, Al Parker, a wild, wildlife biologist, will give a program on the history of the bald eagle reintroduction to Lake Monroe. February 28th, which will mark our 10th anniversary, amazing, uh, James Krause will give a pro, uh, presentation on the Indiana Theater at 100 years of age. Hard to believe that's been here that long. March 28th, next year, Hillary Fleck will return to give a program on her exhibit at the History Center, Order Up. She'll, she'll have lots of photos of the old uh, iconic restaurants from here in Bloomington. Uh, April 25th, John Baton had to reschedule this, but he's going to do a program. You know, he asked, what would it look like to walk through the streets of Bloomington more than 100 years ago? The Rediscovering Bloomington Project seems to, seeks to answer these questions. Uh, May 30th, Susan Snyder, there will be a, a program on the history of dry stack stone walls in Monroe County. June 27th, James Capshew, the life and time of, uh, of Herman Wells. And July 25th, the history of Bloomington Cats TV. Uh, I've been after them to give their own history and we've finally got them nailed down here. So, because a lot of people don't know a lot of what they do and uh, they do some pretty important stuff. Bring us to today. Our guest today is John Summerlot. Uh, one of the things I like most about this gig is having speakers who uh, enjoy it so much they return to make other talks. <laughs> So John is one of those. We've had several of those, and uh, this is John's third, and uh, the other two were excellent. I know this one will be as well. So a lot of you may be asking yourself, what is our beauty mania? Well, along with me, you're all going to find out. John? Okay, so for, for those of y'all, I, I have to put this disclaimer out there at the beginning. For those of y'all that are flower people, and when you saw Arbutus, you knew what Arbutus was, and you were like, oh my God, I can't wait to learn more about that flower and how great it is, you're going to be really bored by this presentation. Because I am, as my family will vouch, my wife will tell you repeatedly, my mom's here, if you don't believe me, you can ask her, uh, I know nothing about flowers. And that will come out in this process of just how much I don't know by the number of people that I had to drag into this process. Uh, some of which are here today, thankfully, uh, to, to help out with this. So I'll talk a little bit about Arbutus mania, and I, I'm, I got a little quiz to start it off with, uh, but I got to talk first about how I sort of came to this uh, and how I, I got involved. Uh, so I, I often get into these rabbit holes, um, as my wife calls them, where uh, somebody asks a question, they want to know something about something, and I go, I don't know anything about that. That'd be fascinating. Yeah, I want to learn about that. And like three months later, I come back out of the archives, Dina's kicking me out and saying, okay, we need you to go home, you know, whatever. Uh, and th these things happen over and over again. This happened during COVID with questions about Arbutus Hill. So during COVID, there was nowhere for me to go. Uh, I had nothing to do except scour the internet, dig through the digital archives, read lots of online newspapers, uh, all of this sort of stuff to develop this. But the one thing you could do was go outside and walk through the woods. So I did a lot of that too. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so this all started off, uh, my friend Kevin Scott, uh, who is the historian for Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, uh, asked me, 
he said, hey, I got this newspaper article from the Indianapolis Recorder from 1912 about an event that Kappa Alpha Psi was having. Kappa Alpha Psi was the first black fraternity at IU. And it mentions in the article that they're doing all these dinners and they're gonna have these people there and everything else. And then there will be an outing to Arbutus Hill in the afternoon. What's Arbutus Hill and where's that at? Well, I don't know, Kevin, great question. I feel like I should know that because there's a lot of things around here named Arbutus. So what things do we have that are named Arbutus? This is the quiz part. So what things do we have in this town that are named Arbutus? The yearbook, that's the one most people know, right? The IU yearbook is named Arbutus. What's that? We have a road, we have Arbutus Drive, right? Which is gonna come into play again later on uh, because that's not where Arbutus Hill is despite my early attempt at trying to figure that out. Uh, so, what else do we have, anybody? Yeah, that's the, that's the end of the line, right? Now, somebody brought it up earlier, we do have an Arbutus Society that is part of our IU Foundation. Uh, we, we have, there's a lot more Arbutus around than you probably realize. Uh, so, I headed to the archives and I, I went to Brad uh, who, by this point, I think all the archivists are used to me coming in with random questions. Uh, and I said, Brad, I said, where's Arbutus Hill at? He goes, we don't know. And I was like, okay, no, seriously. And he said, no, we don't know. He says, it's four miles east of town. Where? And he goes, we don't know. We, we sort of lost track, right? That's not entirely true and not entirely their fault. And we'll get into why that is uh, uh, later on. But Arbutus Hill it was actually a little bit of a secret. Like the actual location was kind of a rite of passage for students to go out to it and see it. So they didn't just advertise it. It wasn't something that was put out all over the place, but it sort of leaked out a little bit. So I went to the archives and I pulled up the, the folder, the reference file uh, on Arbutus, uh, and there's amazingly little in it. Uh, there's like five things, five pieces of paper that are in it, one of which is this 1993 article from the Indiana Alumni Magazine that has a very, it's a copy, there's a very beautiful painting by Mary Wampler, I actually have a copy of it up here in color uh, that she did of Arbutus, uh, and it gives you a little bit of history, and it talks about how uh, the yearbook is named Arbutus in 1894 when they launched the yearbook, they named it uh, Arbutus and talks a little bit about why, but it's kind of vague in general. Then there was this, which I found fascinating. Uh, so this is actually a, a history of the chain of office. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, if you've never seen the university president up close, there's a giant medallion that the president wears and there's a, a, a big necklace that goes with it. And President Witten, because this necklace is really heavy and, and really big, uh, she actually had the chain cut, made into it, or uses a different chain uh, with the medallion, right? But the medallion, uh, wrong direction, there you go. But the medallion itself, uh, this is a close-up of it. Uh, if you look at it, uh, oh, I didn't bring my glasses up with me and this is small print. The jewel uh, is uh, bordered with leaves and flowers of the trailing arbutus, the Indiana University flower. The center background carries eight piercings in the shape of the arbutus leaf. Uh, the 22 lines engraved between the piercings represent the number of states in the union at the time the university was founded. Uh, the jewel of office is attached to the chain of office by an emblem of Arbutus leaves and encircling the seal of the state of Indiana. The chain of office was donated to the university in 1958 uh, by the Lambda chapter of Sigma Chi and is handcrafted of gold-plated sterling silver, uh, so on and so forth talks about the jewels and stuff that it includes. There's also a provost's medallion uh, that also has uh, Arbutus around it. And in fact, every major medal awarded from the university has Arbutus around the edges of it. And when you look at, through both the yearbook, when you look at a lot of the iconography, you look at a lot of the carvings, you look at a lot of the things that are on campus, you start to see Arbutus everywhere. It's in the details of everything. And nobody's real sure why. Uh, in fact, we're not even real sure how Arbutus is known as the official university flower. 
good luck finding where that was designated at anywhere in the trustees minutes I've searched. Uh, but it, it's known as that. And so it creeps up when you look at scroll work anywhere, there's decorative carvings or any of those sort of things on campus, you'll see little hints of Arbutus that are there as a part of it. Uh, and so this got me curious. Uh, and so I kept going. Uh, this is a really bad photo. This is a photo of the actual scan of a newspaper article uh, from 1904. This is IDS in 1904. Uh, Indiana Daily Student. Above is reproduced a peep at one of the ravines of Arbutus Hill where grows the university flower. Arbutus Hill is the only place in the state where this rare flower thrives. Efforts to transplant it to campus have always proved unsuccessful. I can tell you a hundred years later that that is still the case. Uh, there have been multiple attempts to transplant it to campus that have been unsuccessful. Uh, the last of this year's Arbutus is now disappearing and the journeys of students to the hill have well nigh ceased. A movement to purchase the hill and preserve it as the property of the university and the home of the college flower is now on foot. It is proposed that the class of 1905 purchase the hill and deed it to the university as a class memorial. This was the first of at least six attempts or efforts to get the university to purchase Arbutus Hill uh, in the last hundred years. Uh, so, and then lastly, uh, this is actually a passage, it was photocopied that was in the file out of a book uh, called Out of the Depths uh, by Anton Boysen. Uh, he wrote this in 1960 and it says, from the early years I had heard much from my mother about Arbutus Hill, the hill which lay five miles east of town. So is it four or five? This is a problem that we'll run into. So the hill which lay five miles east of town was associated with my father's memory. It was he who had discovered it and the trailing Arbutus from which it took its name had been adopted as the college flower. This hill was believed to be the only place in the state where Arbutus grew and every spring scores of people visited the hill and brought back a few little sprays. While still in my first year of high school, I had joined these pilgrims and I continued to go there every spring. During my second year in college, I found my first new hill. So maybe there's more than one hill. Uh, I shall never forget that day. The Arbutus was out in all its glory. So now there's maybe two hills. There's maybe one four miles and maybe one five miles from town. We're not real sure other than it's east of town exactly what we're looking at or where we're going. Uh, so this is the point when, when Brad threw me the bigger curveball and said, Oh, by the way, 1908, 1909, we have these newspaper articles about a wildfire wiping out Arbutus Hill and how it didn't grow back. Okay, maybe the Arbutus isn't there anymore. That explains why we don't talk about it now. That explains why nobody knows where it is. Okay, sad point, we'll come back to that. Then Brad goes, but oh, by the way, here's a 1905 map that Anton Boysen drew of the county and all of the places that Arbutus grows in the county, there are at least 17 or 18 different places on here. <laughs> Luckily, there are only two that are four to five miles east of town. So which of these, and this, uh, so here's Bloomington, and then if you look over here, you can see a couple little X's and a couple little X's, and they're labeled number one and number two. Uh, and on the, the, what goes along with the map, it says a list of places where Arbutus may be found to accompany the map. Number one, the old hill found in 1879. Number two, 1885, question mark. So, which we look back, founding of the Arbutus uh, um, yearbook, trying to space it out, which of these would have been the Arbutus hill? We, everything after this was dated after that time period. We also know from looking at Anton Boysen's uh, time as a student, and he said that he discovered his first hill while he was in college, uh, that th the second hill would be the one that he discovered. The first would have been the one that his dad discovered. But then the question became, which of these is the Arbutus Hill? So not to mention, this is a 1905 map. Uh, this will come up again later on. Uh, what somebody reported in the 1920s uh, that they were a student reporter for the uh, IDS said, don't worry, by 1975, this will be a suburb of Bloomington. So whether or not these hills were even there anymore, whether or not these hills even existed, and where exactly are these hills on this otherwise unlabeled map that just has red lines and streets and everything, 
became the challenge. And this is what I started staring at during COVID. Uh, and if you know anything about me, I'm a big map geek. I like maps. Uh, so I started comparing maps. That became my next step. So I took the 1895 Monroe County map, I took a 1920 Monroe County map, and I started looking at it to figure out what exactly street was I looking at? Uh, where was this number one and this number two, and which streets were these that we could sort of compare them to? And I made a tragic error, but it turned out to be a fateful one. So in the process of doing this, as I was looking at the current map, uh, and I realize I'm jumping back and forth a little bit here. The only road that cuts off significantly to the south is Bender Road. Uh, and it was, Bender Road is about five miles from town, depending on what you're measuring from. Are you measuring from campus? Are you measuring from the edge of town, from the courthouse? Where exactly are you doing that at? So, okay, I have a friend that lives on Bender Road. So let me reach out to my friend that lives on Bender Road and ask her if she's ever heard anything about Arbutus ever being in that area or anything about it ever being called Arbutus Hill or any of those things. Once I made that reach out, I had to wait a little bit, had to do a little bit more research uh, to see what would come up. But in the process, she said, actually, I've got two neighbors that have lived here a long time. Uh, and those two neighbors may have a little bit of information for you to help you out. And I said, okay, well, let's try that then. And so the first one, Jeffrey Huntsman emailed me back and he says about 150 meters west of the Bender Road intersection is a little snub of a lane that used to be called Arbutus Lane and now is something else. Running gradually downhill towards Stevens Creek Valley from the end of it, Arbutus was only a wagon path, if that's even still there. I haven't been on it in about 40 years. And Barbara replied back that I think the Arbutus Lane, AKA Arbutus Tabernacle Road, mentioned by Jeffrey is now named South Twinleaf Trace. It is near what is now Latimer Preserve. I haven't been there in years. So what they're talking about, this is where, eh, let me use my little pointer here. Hey, my pointer works, okay. So I was searching in this area over here on Bender Road. They were putting me back over here on Latimer Preserve, but that there's no road out of there. This road to the left does not look like the road on the old maps. Uh, and so that became a little bit of a confusion, but okay, I really looked forward to the fact that as I looked at it on an aerial photograph, this is actually a county GIS map, uh, luckily there's no trees or no leaves on the trees. And so as I was looking at this, I could actually see there's an old dirt road or a wagon path that runs out and goes down this side right over here. And if you look at it long enough, zoomed out far enough, it matches identically what is in the 1897 and the 1920s maps uh, for this area. So, okay, I'm in the right spot now. Arbutus Tabernacle Church, uh, which many of y'all may have never heard of, is a rather small little church. I'm not exactly sure how much it is used. Uh, that is located right at where this big curve is in the road right here behind Latimer Preserve. Uh, County GIS told me that was uh, uh, Arbutus Tabernacle Church, so I knew I was in the right spot. Okay, I'm getting closer. Hill 2 is looking really promising. Uh, but now I ran into this other issue of, if you look at this, if you're familiar with satellite photos or, or topography, that's not a hill. That is ravines. That is ditches. They're steep. They are harsh. If you know anything about Arbutus, you would have known I was in the right place. I do not know anything about Arbutus, so I did not know that I was in the right place. Again, I know nothing about flowers, right? So, so I said, what pictures do we have? And Brad and I started looking through pictures. Uh, and so we had this picture that was labeled as being Arbutus Hill uh, in the archives. And it looks like what you would expect, right? This big scenic hill that a bunch of uh, local college and high school kids are going out and, and frolicking on and, and having good times on. Okay, that, that makes a little sense, but that doesn't look like the area that I'm looking at on the map. And he said, well, we got these couple of other pictures that are kind of close-ups that are zoomed in on stuff. And I said, okay, what do you got? And he sent me this one. This is actually a postcard. Uh, that I'll come back to later, uh, that was uh, sold locally to mail home to show pictures of Arbutus Hill. Okay, this looks a little bit more like the steep ravines. This looks a little bit more like what that area that I'm looking at. Uh, but is there a, you know, any, what else do you have? And he said, yeah, he says, we got this one. Uh, and if you can't tell, this is actually a person uh, sliding down a hill that is so steep uh, that that tells you how steep the ravine is, right? Uh, and we have this one. 
which here you can definitely see the steepness of the hill, the little curve and the creek down here. I said, yes, that definitely looks like the area that I'm looking at on this number two site that's out here. Uh, but again, I don't know if I should be looking at number one or number two. They're both four to five miles east of town. They both sort of fit the description. Uh, we'll have to figure out where to go from there. Uh, and so the area that I got really interested in was this side right over here where you can see the, the ravines at. There's a little red line that runs through here right here you can see. That is a property boundary line. And so I said my next step is going to have to be to talk to the people that own both of those pieces of property. How do you contact people that live out in the middle of nowhere to ask them about the history of their property during COVID? You don't just walk up and knock on the door and be like, hey, I got questions, uh, right? I grew, up, I grew up close enough to the country. I know you also just don't walk up to people's house and do that in the country, and that might not always be greeted well. Uh, so I went old fashioned, I mailed a letter. Uh, and I looked up mailing addresses and I sent letters out, and then I had to wait. I had to wait and hope that somebody read those letters, that somebody still checks their mail, uh, that they, they got them. They didn't think I was some weird guy trying to sell them car insurance or something else. Uh, and actually, So I had to wait. So while I waited, I said, let me keep doing research. By this point, I'm like four months into this project. Uh, so let me keep going. I'm going to look at the trustees. I'm going to look at the newspapers. So the Board of Trustees minutes, uh, really interesting. They're actually from 1983. Uh, March 4th and May 6th of the trustees minutes. Um, so on March 4th, Trustee Long stated he had learned from a booklet entitled Indiana University Facts, just distributed by the IU News Bureau, that the university has an official flower, the trailing arbutus. He stated that he would like to see it. President Ryan responded by stating that although the flower is relatively rare, representations are many, including one on the jewel of the office of the president. He will ask Professor Charles Hagen, chairman of the Arboretum Planning Committee, to search out a trailing arbutus in the wild and inform the board of where it may be seen. I heard some chuckles. You already know where this is going. So May 6th, uh, Professor Hagen comes back to speak with the trustees and he says, it grows quite plentifully about four miles east of Bloomington at Arbutus Hill. Really, can't get a street address? This is 1983, we can't get a street address? So, to which crowds of enthusiastic pede pedestrians go every April to secure the dainty blossoms that lie hidden under the, dark, uh, hidden under the deadened leaves of winter. In 1960, Professor Hagen reported Anton Boysen wrote the President Wells and suggested the university preserve the habitat of the trailing Arbutus near Arbutus Tabernacle Oh, good clue, okay, I know I'm in the right spot. But in consultation with Professor Weatherwax of the Botany Department, it was decided that the plant was not so rare as to be endangered uh, in the slow development of that area. Just last week, uh, Professor Hagen read a proposal in the IDS that a 10-acre tract southeast of town be registered with the Nature Conservancy because there's trailing arbutus growing down there. So in other words, the university said, hey, we can find this stuff in lots of places. We don't need to, to grab that plot of land. We don't need to hold on to that. We'll be fine. So then I went to the newspapers. Uh, this was actually kind of surprising to me uh, how I expected to find you know, maybe a mention here or there. From 1887 to 1956, there were 32 articles in the newspaper talking about Arbutus, the big, biggest cluster of them being from about 1902 to about 1921 or so. Um, that's really the height of the excitement about Arbutus uh, going through. So we'll talk a little bit about what some of those were. The very first reference is 1887. Uh, excursions to Arbutus Hill are the order of the day. 1902, Arbutus Hill was dotted all over from top to bottom Sunday, not with Arbutus, but young folks who looked in vain for the trailing flower. Now, why did they look in vain? There was, there quickly, by the late 1890s, early 1900s, became a university-wide contest that local folks would also participate in to see who could be the first one to bring back Arbutus blooms uh, from Arbutus Hill. So Arbutus uh, is one of the first flowers of spring to bloom, blooms in April, uh, really coincides a lot with mushroom season. And so a lot of folks were, were heading out and trying, and they would try to win this contest, and you get your name in the paper if you were the first person to bring back the flowers each year. 
Uh, so a couple other headlines that, or parts that came from that. An effort's underway to purchase the Hill. The effort is being led by the class of 1905. Professor proposes seniors buy Arbutus Hill as a memorial, 1923. Uh, this is a book nook advertisement uh, from 1911. They offer, they have 150 different views to select. You can send postcards home to your family. Campus views, Bloomington views, street scenes, university buildings, Arbutus Hill. One of the postcards that you could send home to your parents. Hey, mom, dad, look, I went to this place and I smelled these flowers. So uh, that was actually part of the, the postcard. Uh, so 1912, IDS says, usually though, the well-dressed go out to Arbutus Hill on Sunday. If you are walking and have to wear old clothes, you can go on Saturday and take a lunch. One of the themes that I hope you will see as I talk about this, one of the fascinating things about Arbutus Hill and I'll diverge from the, the search a little bit to talk about campus culture. The early 1900s, there were not a lot of places that men and women could be together and be unsupervised, right? You had to have a chaperone. If there was a dance, if there was an event, even if you just went out on a date, you often had a chaperone with you on that date, right? But what the students figured out rather quickly is that this is the early fresh air health movement. Uh, and if a group of women get together and decide we're going to plan a hike out to Arbutus Hill on Saturday, we're going to pack a picnic lunch and we're going to go out there and we're going to tell everybody this group of women is going out to Arbutus Hill. Guess what magically happens? <laughs> a group of men magically goes out to Arbutus Hill as well, right? Uh, and of course, what the college students are doing, suddenly the local youth want to do as well, right? Oh, no, no, it's okay, Mom, Dad, don't worry. I'm just hiking out to Arbutus Hill with my girlfriends. We'll just be out there. Don't worry about us, right? Uh, it was also fascinating because it was something that you can see spanned all of the, the, the class levels, if you will, of the time. So you have... Uh, the, 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 everybody can afford to walk four or five miles out there to go on this adventure. You don't have to be rich to do this. You don't have to have a horse. You don't have to do all these things. But you also see people that are taking their carriages and their horses out there, and they are making these trips, right? Uh, you'll see that uh, both the local African-American residents and African-American students are participating in this. So this is also an interracial space. Uh, and, and everybody is out there on this hill hunting for these little bitty flowers. Calls of spring holiday and canceled classes called Arbutus Day. There was a movement for about four years uh, to actually cancel classes to search for Arbutus on Arbutus Day. Um, you know, students will cancel class for anything, don't get me wrong, right? Like, uh, but there were professors, there were faculty uh, that, that thought this would be a great idea as well. The annual spring contest to find the first bloom. These are some of the repeated topics that come in. Oh, this is my favorite. Coeds frolicked without social rules, but were discreet. <laughs> There's no additional context. I don't, I don't. Uh, faculty and students rushing out to save Arbutus Hill during wildfires. This, this is a big news story that happened. Every time a wildfire got near Arbutus Hill, students and faculty would literally hear about it and walk out of class. And then everybody would run out there and help fight wildfires that were coming through the area to save Arbutus Hill. Now, remember that 1908, 1909 fire that I mentioned earlier? Well, come to find out, that wasn't the first one, it wasn't the last one, but it never totally did away with the Arbutus. The Arbutus was still out there. So this effort to keep trying to preserve it continued on and kept happening. Uh, so 1916, uh, clever co-ed reporter scoops whole staff on Arbutus story. Uh, the cheerful optimism, she expects it to be out next week. Uh, I'll read a little bit that comes out of this. Uh, Arbutus grows according to the Red Book and other eyewitnesses. So the Red Book was a, a book, for, do you know, was it just for the women? All students. Okay. Red Book was like your orientation guide uh, for students. It was all everything you needed to know about being a student at IU. Uh, so according to the Red Book, the other eyewitnesses on a hill, uh, and other eyewitnesses on a hill in what is, will be the suburbs of Bloomington in 1975, it is a favorite destination for hiking parties because the round trip totals up about 10 miles. So four trips to Arbutus Hill in one semester will give an ambitious Women's Athletic Association member 25 points towards her sweater. 
Uh, and then the more romantically and leisurely inclined, eschewing all stopwatches and pedometers, uh, are want to seek a celebrated spot via Phaeton or Ford, right? So getting fancy now, we're taking cars out there uh, in order to, to get there. So 1916, I actually ran across what was, uh, what turned out to be the most fortuitous uh, article that I could find. Cub reveals carefully hidden secret concerning Arbutus Hill. It's not a hill after all, he finds. It's a succession of cliffs and precipices covered with dead leaves and moss, flowers hard to discover. I've never related to a headline so much in my life. <laughs> so this was the piece that I was looking for. This was what, what put everything together for me uh, when I finally read this. Our, uh, Arbutus Hill is a fake. It isn't a hill at all. It is hills. Each spring, as soon as the dandelions begin to lift their saffron faces up from green lawns, students, when it isn't raining, line the Third Street Pike on their way to Arbutus Hill. The place is more important to Bloomington than Dead Man's Hill is to France. There is more talk about Arbutus Hill than any other piece of nature's architecture hereabouts. And all of the talk is misleading. People who have been to the place where our school flower grows have never been known to tell exactly where they found it. They show interested persons a bunch of Arbutus, and that is the end of it. The impression is left on one's mind that the place is a steep, mountain-like hill. The writer, after hearing talk about the hill for three years, determined to investigate for himself. Having been there and seen the sights, he will now attempt to show that the place is not at all what it's cracked up to be. To go to the hill, one takes 3rd Street Pike and travels exactly five miles eastward. Guy Davis has lined the road with wallpaper and mileposts, and one knows to the inch where he has gone the allotted five miles. After the four mile post has been passed, the walker should begin to get nervous and inquire of everyone where the hill is. They will always tell one just where it is, because there is no hill in sight. After three-fourths of a mile, uh, post after, oh, about three-fourths of a mile past the four-mile post, one comes to a big horseshoe bend. Before beginning to make the bend, one always wonders if he should not go around the turn. No hill, which looks a bit like the imagined Arbutus Hill, stands out on either side of the road. Finally, one decides to go around the turn, and where he has traversed the entire horseshoe, which is half a mile long, he has advanced 100 yards toward the Hill of Desire. At the other end of the bend, there stands a house, and from this house usually come two little barefoot boys who will volunteer to conduct the traveler to the hill. They will act as guides and expect to be treated as such. All kids like candy, you know, and if you have no candy, money will do. At last you are at the hill, and here is where the rider was keenly disappointed. He had always pictured the hill as standing alone, skirted by trees, wrapped with trailing arbutus, a place of ideal picnics, he had hoped to find something beautiful and mysterious and, uh, and ugly. Uh, in the first place, Arbutus Hill, as it has been stated, is not one single hill. It is a convulsion. Nature must have been suddenly petrified with the act of doing a Hungarian rhapsody. The country out there is just one series of ups and downs, mostly ups. Deep ravines greet one at every turn, and the insurmountable precipices make themselves evident on all sides. About the only place that such topography could be called beautiful would be in a prairie where it would at least be unusual. <laughs> briars, moss, and snakes, thick underbrush composed of briars, brambles, impedes progress, and slippery moss makes one's equilibrium very unstable. So I'm gonna pause for a second here and jump ahead in the story. While I was out there searching this, these hillsides uh, down the road in a couple of months, I had a moment where, um, so my background is military. I do search and rescue out in the woods all the time. I'm used to these sort of things happen. I admit they happen, not perfect. I took what we call a tactical descent. Some people may call that a slide or a fall down a significant face. It was probably a solid 45 feet of nonstop trying to stop myself sliding into a creek at the bottom. I hit the bottom of the creek that literally, as I stood up, my phone went off, right? And I, I got a text message from my daughter, and she says, everything okay, Dad? 
I seriously had a moment where I thought my iPhone had texted my family because it had detected I had fallen that far that fast. And I was like, yeah, sure, everything's fine. She's like, okay, I just thought you'd be home by now. And I was like, oh, yeah, nope, everything's fine. As I looked down at myself covered in mud from head to toe and drenched in the creek water. Um, so this is the area that we're talking about. Uh, of course, the flowers are there. It is the only place in this part of the country where one may find the trailing flowers of fame. It's probably the only place in Indiana where they wouldn't grow if they didn't want to be real popular. Sometimes Arbutus is referred to as the flower that doesn't want to be found. The plants, true to their name, trail along the ground and cover practically all over the ground where they grow. The leaves are great, large things, elephant ears in comparison with the flowers, which are very hard to find. The ground is not painted a delicate pink and white with the flowers. Don't imagine that for a minute. One has to get down on hands and knees and scratch around in the ground to uncover the little blooms. They attempt to conceal themselves and seem much averse to publicity. And he goes on to say how, uh, you know, everybody should go to the hill, but if you go to the hill, bring a flower back, and then don't tell anybody where the hill is or that the hill is not a single hill. That it is a, this is a part of the surprise, this is part of the excitement that you are disappointed by what you find out there. I realize that sounds strange. That was actually my experience. So I was surprised by what I found out there. So next I went to, I said I mailed those letters to the owners. Uh, so next question came from the owners, what do you know about it? So the first person to get back, back with me uh, was the owner that lives on this side of the hill, the, what's the left side on the map over here, uh, the west side. Uh, and that turned out to be a gold mine uh, initially in that, yes, she was familiar with Arbutus growing out there. She was familiar with the fact that it was known as Arbutus Hill. In fact, uh, DNR had actually come out and asked to look for Arbutus in that area as part of some work that they were doing with the Latimer Preserve, which is up here in front of it. Uh, the other owner that lives on the backside back here contacted me uh, and said, oh yes, I'm very familiar with it being Arbutus Hill. Uh, in fact, my mother-in-law was Herman Wells's secretary, uh, and she was the one who brought him the bouquet of Arbutus that was displayed in his office uh, every spring uh, that nobody could figure out where he got or how it came there. And I said, well, that solves a lot of questions too, right? So this is definitely a Arbutus Hill. It seems to be the Arbutus Hill. So where on this map, keep in mind that this is, uh, you know, from here to here, actually off the bottom of this a little bit, and all this, this is all Arbutus Hill. And this is a pretty good space. This is a pretty good area. Uh, so I thought, what are the chances that some Arbutus is still growing out there? So we went to the search portion. Remember that part I said about not being good with flowers? Uh, now I'm going to go out there and look for a bunch of tiny flowers under a bunch of dead leaves on some really steep hills. Uh, so what's my instinct? I need to take some people with me, right? So I called Brad. I said, Brad, you got me into this. You got to come help me with this. And Brad was down for it. Uh, and I called Jim Capshu, uh, who's here as well. I called Jim and I said, hey, Jim, here's what I'm doing. And Jim goes, hey, I know a guy. Like a, like a good friend, right? Jim's like, I, I know a guy. So it turns out that he knew someone who had written their master's thesis on Arbutus, <laughs> a retired librarian uh, who he could bring out to help us with the search. And I said, good, somebody that knows what they're looking for, because it's not me. Uh, and along the way, we both had a mutual friend, uh, the director of the IU Research and Teaching, or the manager of the IU Research and Teaching Preserve, uh, and we got him involved as well because he had seen Arbutus before. In fact, he'd photographed it. He had seen it in other places in the county. Uh, and so he knew what he was looking for, and I said, that sounds great. Let's head out. Uh, and so we went out, and we scoured for probably, I was there about four hours. I think Jim and Roger may have made it two, two and a half. Uh, look to see if Jim's countering me on that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, up and down this terrain, back and forth, we found nothing. No, well, I mean, we found lots of stuff that wasn't Arbutus, but we found nothing. So that search would then 
go on. That's where the mania sets in. That's where my wife lost track of me, um, thought I went off the deep end. It was COVID. I didn't have a lot else to do. Uh, so my excuse to get outside every day or every couple of days uh, was to go to this property. I'd gotten permission from the property owners to search for Arbutus. I probably, over the course of about three weeks, spent probably a total of about 40 hours uh, searching this area. Keep in mind, I'm applying my search and rescue and military sort of background. I've, I've gridded it off. I've searched this. I've gridded it off. I searched that. I still don't really know what I'm looking for, uh, and, but I'm trying. I'm trying really hard. I figure if all else fails, somewhere the IU gods will will bless me and make me trip over it and be like, oh look, there it is, right? Uh, one of the things that I did, I had done early on, uh, before Arbutus would have been out in the winter, is I started walking around out there with the photos on my iPad uh, and trying to compare some of the photos that we had in the archives to the spaces that were out there. And so this little trail line right through here, you can see the creek, uh, that matches what is in the photo from the archives. Uh, here's another view of it, a slightly different angle. Uh, this big tree you see right here matches this tree on the curve in the creek right there. So we knew we were pretty close to being in the right area. There's other ravines that look like this. I've been in plenty of them elsewhere in the county. Uh, but the, the pictures were adding up, the things were adding up to what we could see. Now, w when we brought the uh, manager for the research and teaching preserve, uh, uh, Michael, uh, out with us, he said, you know, we actually have some Arbutus uh, on the front page of the IU Herbarium. So the IU Herbarium is this collection of, of plants uh, from around the state that they have. And he goes, actually, the picture that's on there is a picture I took. And this is the record card that's uh, superimposed over it uh, for the, when they, the sample that they have in the herbarium. And so I went and looked at it, and it says, in Clarence Latimer's Woods, four miles west of Bloomington. See, y'all are, are laughing. I was flabbergasted, but this is after I've been out there for a while. So I see this, and this card, I actually asked him to, uh, I asked Michael to get me the actual card so I could read the rest of what was on it. And down at the bottom, it has a little note that says Arbutus Hill is the place where the sample was taken from. So again, four miles west of Bloomington, Latimer's Woods. Latimer Woods today is much smaller than it was before. Okay, I still know I'm in the right general area. This is the card that goes with it. Arbutus Hill, Monroe County, east of Bloomington. Uh, tells a little bit about the location. And this sample was taken October 21st, 1927. So we know that there was plenty of Arbutus there even in the 1920s. The fires hadn't managed to uh, take it out by that point. So I spent an entire season, keep in mind it only flowers April, May time frame, about a three week window. Uh, and I spent a lot of that three weeks out there hiking up and down, getting my physical conditioning in, getting my exercise in, uh, doing that and found nothing. Uh, and I kind of reported back, a little bit bummed. Hey, I didn't find this flower. I, you know, Jim tried to reassure me. He's like, I'm pretty certain you found Arbutus Hill though. I'm pretty sure you got the right spot. Uh, this makes sense. Brad was on board. He's like, I think we got the right spot. And I was just kind of, a little frustrated that I hadn't actually seen any Arbutus. Uh, and this is the point when Michael stepped in, he said, hey, you remember I told you I took that picture of Arbutus somewhere else in the county? He says, do you want to at least go see it? I was like, oh yeah? <laughs> Come so he takes me out to this other location that I've been sworn to secrecy uh, to not give up, and takes me out to this location, shows me the Arbutus, the flowers died maybe five or six days before we got there. The petals are still like laying on the ground. And he goes, but now you know where it is if you want to come back and see it next year. Twelve months later, well, 11 and a week later, I'm back out there. Not once, because it hadn't bloomed yet. Not twice, because it still hadn't bloomed yet. Three times. And it is equally as difficult to get to. Uh, it is a mile and a half hike if you know where you're going to this location and back through some of that rugged terrain. I made that trip three times until the day finally came that I got out there and the Arbutus was blooming, right? So for record, I have a standard size iPhone. That is the size of flowers that you are looking for. This is a close up of them. This is me way too happy with myself about actually having the chance to see these. Uh, 
Now, this whole patch, and part of the reason that I'm kind of sworn to secrecy where this is, this whole patch of Arbutus is only about six feet long and about four to five feet wide. It's a very small patch. Uh, and it's in a precarious sort of position. Uh, the tails of Arbutus Hill, the entire hill was covered with the Arbutus, right? Uh, and so much so that when you went down in the valleys, you could smell the flowers coming in as you were walking through. That was one of the big attractions. So keep in mind, early 1900s, the beginning of the outdoor movement, people are super excited about getting out and doing these things. Um, people also weren't bathing as often as they do today. Uh, and so the chance to, for these perfume smells, these flowers, to get out and see these things, that was part of the attraction uh, of this space and being out there to do it. Uh, so I, would, I, I thought the story was going to end here. I thought this would be the end of it. Uh, having, you know, searched so much of Arbutus Hill, had a conversation with one of the landowners, and I said, you know, we didn't find anything. Uh, um, um, I, don't, I, I think if we told people, you know, where it is, it'll be okay, because we don't have to worry about people coming out and searching for it and doing all of that. Time passed, and I think about two weeks, maybe? About two weeks after we had that conversation, I think it was, landowner contacts me and says, so I have a friend that's a local botanist biologist. She was out there walking around all over this space. Guess what she found? <laughs> no. I spent days out there, right? I don't feel so bad because she did mark the spot. I did go out there to Arbutus Hill. There are, there is one plant with two sets of leaves and no flowers. How, you, you see how small these are. When I say two plants, I mean, I'm talking like this set of leaves and that set of leaves, right? There are two plants with no flowers and she spotted it out there on Arbutus Hill. So if you look back, you remember the map I showed at the beginning in 1905 uh, of the locations that Arbutus is in the county? The place that I'm at in this picture and Arbutus Hill, 100 plus years later, still have Arbutus growing on them. Now the next question I get asked by everybody is, so why doesn't the university bring it to campus? Why don't we put it some, why don't we have it in the Arboretum? Why don't we have it in the greenhouse? Why, and this is where I'm gonna repeat things I was told. Please don't question me on my plant knowledge, okay? So it needs a very particular soil. Uh, it has to be a, per a certain percentage of acidic, a certain percentage of this, certain percentage of that. Uh, it really likes to grow in dead leaves, and so it needs to have a certain amount of sunlight and dead leaves covering it and all of that. It's generally on a slope, so you have to have a significant slope to get it to grow. Uh, and as Michael said, if you don't transplant the soil from around it, when you go to move it to somewhere, it's going to wilt and die immediately. If you transplant the soil, it'll wilt and die eventually. <laughs> so that's how many times this has been tried and practiced. There was an attempt to grow it in the Arboretum. There is no hill in the Arboretum that's significant enough to grow it on. Uh, there's no option to sort of grow it in the greenhouse in a way that it would grow in there. Now, one of the things you heard me say, especially when I was reading things, that Arbutus only grows on this hill in the state of Indiana. That was part mythos part uh, mythology that went along with it that's not entirely true it does grow in several places around southern indiana it is more common in monroe county than it is in other southern indiana counties uh, but it does grow in other places now what is different about it is that uh, it's these the flowers are much smaller here in indiana if you go to the east coast where uh, arbutus is really common you'll find the flowers are much bigger uh, and it grows all the way from like Virginia to Maine on the East Coast, and sometimes it's called Mayflower uh, in those areas. Uh, but it does grow in the Midwest. It also grows up in northern Minnesota somewhere. I recently discovered while Googling, um, there's a northern Minnesota Arbutus Society that uh, uh, protects it up there. But there are these little patches of it. Um, there is apparently also the option to order Arbutus seeds online. Good luck with that. I don't know where those come from. I don't know how they get them. I don't know where they grow them. 
Um, but if you're up for the, if you're one of those green thumb gardeners, not me, um, please feel free to, to try that and let me know if you are successful because you'd be the first person in 100 plus years uh, to be successful at doing this, including a number of our top botanists and scientists at IU uh, that have tried and, and failed on this. Uh, so yeah, here's a little bit of information uh, about me and some of the work that I do, my contact information. Um, and there is a video, a short video, if you want to watch me sniff flowers, there is a short video on our uh, Golden Book uh, YouTube page of me once the time came that I, I finally got a chance to, to do this. Um, all in all, this research project, which started with Kevin asking me where our Butis Hill is in late August, early September of 2019, uh, 29, no, 2020, of 2020, ran me until literally this May when I finally got to sniff a flower. That's a lot, it's a lot of dedication, it's a lot of commitment, to which my wife was highly disappointed when she asked me, what did it smell like? <laughs> my response was, a flower? Look, I do the history piece. I don't do the flower piece, right? It's the first time I've, I've gone for a flower on something like this. Uh, in the process of doing this, though, I realized just how much of we have the Arbutus sort of built into the local community. You'll see it as symbols on things. You'll see it as pieces of things. Uh, it's part of the artwork. Anything 1950s back uh, that is on campus, you'll often see it built into that. Uh, but anytime you see Arbutus or you hear references to Arbutus, now I'm much more tuned in to what those are and what people mean by it. I've read a couple of local things uh, where people have talked about taking trips to Arbutus Hill, uh, local folks that are like, oh, and this weekend we went out to Arbutus Hill. You don't even have to tell me what time of year that was. I can tell you what time of year that was. That was late April to early May that the, they were riding this excursion because that's when everybody went. Uh, and it's a fascinating place that I would love to see more pictures of, learn more about, or know more about uh, what culture and things were happening out there. But you gotta think of the time frame of the early 1900s, you know, this wasn't cell phone era. Nobody was out there taking Instagram photos of, look me with the Arbutus. Uh, they were instead picking it and bringing it back, which may have led to some of the decline in the process of that. Uh, so yeah, that's my Arbutus mania story and how it sort of uh, fluctuates through our community. Uh, by the way, Arbutus uh, Street here in town uh, won out in the process because the property owner uh, was asked uh, about changing the name and changed it to Twin Leaf Trace. That's why it does not show up as Arbutus Lane or Arbutus Tabernacle Lane uh, on your maps anymore. Uh, Twin Leaf Trace, Twin Leaf is also a local indigenous plant. Uh, and so it is named for one of the other things that you can find here in the community. So still a win uh, there in the end, but that's how urban development goes. It's not in a suburb at least, so we're set. All right, any questions? Yes. I've got a great map for you. I, I wasn't naming any names. I didn't want to call anybody out. So, yes, yeah, yeah. It it is. It's the plant that doesn't want to be found. Uh, it's the plant that doesn't want to be sniffed. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's tough to find. So it makes it interesting that one anybody found it in the first place, and then two we decided to make it the university flower. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. Other questions.
So Arbutus got named, the yearbook Arbutus got named the very first year it came out, 1894? Yeah. <laughs> Dina's giving me the four from back there. 1890 something, for 1894. So the Arbutus Hill would have been a few years into campus culture by that point. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that was almost another rabbit hole. Uh, so the painting in reference, I actually have a uh, copy of the book up here. So uh, this is the uh, Mary Rose Wampler uh, painting that she did. She did these wildflowers of Indiana, uh, traveled around the state and painted them. And I really expected, honestly, because they talk about coming to Bloomington, I expected it to be Arbutus Hill. Uh, and she actually thinks a local landowner uh, for providing the space to do that. I have looked up the landowner and the landowner lives in the middle of town in a house in the middle of town. And I'm relatively certain the Arbutus was not on their property, but they may have owned property elsewhere in at that time period and it's not showing up in the records now. So I don't know. I do know it wasn't Arbutus Hill. So yeah. Yes. Twin Leaf Trace, Latimer Woods, uh, which is a, a um, Sycamore Land Trust property. Uh, it runs right next to that. There's a little parking lot at Latimer Woods. And it goes back to that pattern at the church. I guess yep. I needed to know that because the lady I met coming out of Key Ella Department, a very elderly lady, was going out there for a Thanksgiving potluck. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, the church is small, it's well maintained. Um, I've been out there on a Sunday morning and there's still space in the parking lot. Uh, I'm not real sure when they have services or what they have going on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still an active area. Um, Latimer Woods gets people out there walking through it and looking for stuff out there as well. Um, if you go too much past the end of the parking lot, you start getting into private property. Um, so I would just put that out there that before you go out there hunting on your own, sliding down hills or, or any of that, um, you know, make sure you touch base with the, the property owners. What's next? <laughs> Some frangipani, yeah. Next we're going for frangipani. Uh, yeah, no, I think I'm done with flowers. I think if I go after another flower, my wife's gonna leave me because uh, she knows I don't know anything about flowers. Uh, so yeah, no, I've got about, uh, at any given point, I've got about four projects that I'm working on. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. I'm sure Michael will pull me back, so. So I'll leave the book out up here if you wanna come look at it and see the painting up close uh, afterwards. Um, and I'm glad to talk about if you know where any of it is that's not on the map. Uh, you know, that we might be able to more easily have people that wanna go see it, go see it. Um, so that I'm not trekking people out in the middle of nowhere uh, all the time. Thank y'all.